and, and the consumer side slightly later stage than that, maybe more like the two to three million uh, revenue. Um, and we have a UK fund, which is based in London, where we predominantly invest in UK businesses or businesses that have a UK meaningful presence. Um, and then we also have a US fund uh, based in Detroit, which predominantly invests in Midwest focused businesses in the US, uh, slightly later stage, um, maybe more like Series B. Um, but we're a sector agnostic fund. Uh, we've invested in everything from sort of B2B SaaS, marketplaces, consumer. Um, and um, yeah, we're typically investing anywhere from 2 million up to 10 million um, for our first check. And yeah, excited to be here today and talk to you more about um, what specifically we're, we're looking at at Series A and can speak a little bit more on the sort of maybe seed Series A side, uh, side of things, less the pre-seed. Glad to have you on board, Jody, for this talk. Um, next, Lucy, we have Lucy Rose. She's an angel investor at Angel Academy. Hi, lovely to be here. Thanks for inviting me. So yeah, I'm an, I'm an angel investor. I only invest through Angel Academy, who are a um, female focus, so female founder or female co-founded um, angel network. Uh, we come in earlier than Jodie, so we do invest, yeah, pre-seed, um, you know, pre-revenue sometimes with the businesses that we see. And then we also follow on with our investment. So we do keep seeing the businesses that come back to us or when they're, you know, they might be doing a series A and we'll still get involved. I, again, I'm fairly sector agnostic. Um, Angel Academy is a tech focused network. So we do, we see all sorts, med tech, fintech, cybersecurity. Um, I lean towards med tech, but my portfolio is varied. Um, and part of my role at Angel Academy, I help coordinate the due diligence teams when we're looking at um, businesses that we're interested in. So I get to see all the other interested angels, the questions they're asking and the things that they're most interested in. So, yeah, hope hopefully I can be of some help today. Thank you, Lucy. It's a pleasure to have you. Um, we also have Laura Fullerton. She's the founder at Monk. Hi, thanks for having me, Coral. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm the, the founder and CEO of Monk, which is a health tech startup. Um, we launched about a year and a half ago, and essentially we're launching the first uh, smart ice bath and cold water therapy app. This is it's my third startup, but it's my first startup where I've actually raised capital. And at first that seems totally terrifying for me. Um, and we, at the end of and it was about the beginning of this time last year, we raised our friends and family round um, and I took 485k and we are now just raising our seed raise and we're taking 1.5 is our million. Really, we're going for two um, and yeah, hoping to close that in the next couple of months. Amazing. And fingers crossed. Thanks, Laura, for joining us today. We also have Taryn Anderson. She's the co-founder at Impulse for Women. Hello. Thank you very much, Craig, for inviting me to Oil in Tech. It's a pleasure. Uh, well, I'm Trey Anderson. I'm coming from the venture capital since 2016, and then uh, we built in 2017 uh, Impulse for Women. Uh, matchmaking is a non-profit organization, international one, where we are connecting female lead tech entrepreneurs, social impact projects with investors. We cover all lifetime average of startups since the MVP until the IPO. And now we are 11,000 worldwide. Uh, registered and we're going this year for 1,500 uh, investors and uh, happy to be here and join you. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Thanks, Taryn. And I believe you're based in Barcelona, right? Sure. I'm based in Barcelona, but we are operating in worldwide. <laughs> um, and lastly, we have John Seacrest. He's a managing director at Mossy Ventures. Yeah. And, and our programs are somewhat different because we're focused on the question of activating new angel investors. And so we teach angel investing by doing angel investing, collecting 40 people to create a $200,000 fund and then sorting through companies to make it go. We have a Seattle angel conference we've been running for a decade, and now we're running a transatlantic angel conference that we brought, we ran last year twice and we're, we're on the round for third round. So. Um, let, let me also um, take your early introduction and maybe you can leverage this into where you want to go next. You, you mentioned that about, there'd been a substantial pullback in um, funding, but I think that the funding that we see in pre-seed in Seattle has not pulled back in, 
at, at the pre-seed level. And pre-seed is fundamentally different than seed and series A. And that the responses of the angels in each of those categories has been really strikingly different. So early, early money has not slowed down in, in our context in Seattle yet. That's interesting to hear that at a micro level, like it's a little bit different than an aggregate. Um, mm -hmm. and, and this is a great segue to what we're gonna cover is just what is um, early stage funding? Is that just seed? Is that just pre-seed? I wanna demystify and contextualize what this really means so we're, we can all just raise, you know, be on the same um, equal level playing field here. Does anyone wanna step in? So, so I, one of the places we might start that conversation is um, the difference between um, the traditional equity angel approach and other approaches. So we have funds like uh, Tyler Tringas's Calm Fund, which are a revenue-based fund, which uh, essentially are a step below the kinds of companies that um, a, a typical angel will be writing first not family check of somewhere between 200,000 and 700, sorry, sorry. yeah, 200,000 and 750,000 is a, a sweet spot for the early angels in my context. Um, and then you you would expect that maybe there's a 1.5 million che check in there somewhere for your seed round. And then you might expect like a, a 5 million to 10 million check by the time you get to institutional venture that's doing their series A round, or at least that's the context of Seattle. And I know that that shifts dramatically when you move to different countries. And I know that really shifts dramatically when you move from Seattle to the Bay Area. Um, that's interesting to know. I think there's definitely different standards and definitions and what constitutes precede seed uh, series A and such. Jody, I'd like to get your perspective on this. Yeah, because um, I think it's it's a difficult one. I think, it, yeah, like you said, it varies so much depending on the the stage, um, the country, the sector, the company even. Um, I mean, we, we've seen some businesses that we've invested at that have got to, you know, 7 million of revenue and have got there just doing angel rounds um, and never taken institutional capital before that. Um, so it really can vary. Um, I, th I think for us, early stage funding, um is probably difficult um i guess i guess in broadly you have sort of the stage of, of pre-revenue idea on a on a piece of paper uh then you have sort of mvp and then you have the sort of um stage at which you're ready to take on sort of i guess more institutional capital um i guess that's how i'd probably break it up i'd, I'd still i'd still say series a for us is early stage um but recognize yeah for some Maybe maybe they cut that off around seed. Um. Okay, and and Taryn, what's your perspective from Barcelona? Well, actually, uh, more than Bar Barcelona, we're talking about different countries, different uh, ways of investment. Uh, from our venture capital, we are investing in United States, Canada since two thousand eight, and early stage. And the ticket size that we are using is not the same ones that we use here in Spain or in uh, Germany. And we always uh, compare that in Silicon Valley, we're talking about 15 million spare money valuation of a company will be six in U the UK or Germany and two in Spain, for example. So we always have to get an approach of depending on the geography where we are talking, we will have different types of valuations of the same company or the same sector. Okay. And Lucy, would you have anything to share from an angel perspective? Um, in terms, I mean, I think from our perspective as an angel network, we are just by definition early stage. Um, that being said, we might still be in involved when it gets a bit later, but we'll always be following our money rather than just getting involved by then. Um, yeah, and I mean, valuations, exactly when we hear about we, we're a UK network and hearing about valuations coming over from the states is yeah it's a completely different world out there I think <laughs> so your definition of series A I mean I don't know if that translates into the revenue that they're generating at that valuation 
if if that is also a multiplier or just if the valuations are on a multiple. Okay. Uh, well, as I anticipated, I don't think we're going to reach a consensus of what early stage really, how we can really define early stage investment. I think it's different across the board, different across different geographies, as was noted by some of the speakers. Um, but what we can do is at least we can try to include from angel up until possibly series A in this conversation. Um, so um, what I'd like to cover next is really how to prepare for fundraising. So. A lot of entrepreneurs right now are thinking, well, this is a market downturn. How do I prepare? How do I position myself you know, to be in a position of strength? Um, Laura, I, you know, your fundraising at the moment, um, you shared some guidance with me um, on an earlier call. Like, would you like to tell us a little bit about how your fundraising has been going and some of the, you know, some guidance that you'd like to share? Yeah, sure. I think, um... Our seed raise, it feels completely different to the previous friends and family, because when I was first raising, it was just on a piece of paper, right? We didn't have a product. It was just an idea. I didn't really know if we were going to be able to execute it in terms of like, could we build the product in the way we wanted? So, you know, investors were really having to put a lot of trust in me and my vision. Um, and because I'd never fundraised before, I, honestly, I didn't really know how to go about it, but what I did do is bring in one guy, Lee, who's now my chairman. Um, so he came on board and he was actually my my first investor. And his background was, you know, really heavily involved in fundraising. So once he invested, he could introduce me to, you know, five or 10 of his friends that could likely come in. And I think the thing I found was most helpful, and I, I completely stand by this today, is just building your network that has been so phenomenal um, and actually I joined a couple of groups one is called Adorium and they've been incredibly helpful they have you know really diverse uh, set of people in there um, in the group but there you know there are a lot of investors in there um, so that's been really fantastic and you know if you're meeting someone in that kind of quite a relaxed setting you get to know them you get to know what they're about and you know you meet someone face to face and they're like oh you should talk to my friend and it just kind of snowballs from there so that's really really helpful um what else really worked for me? Oh, one thing as well that I also swear by is just having really, really solid communication in place from day one. So, you know, I send monthly investor emails um, out just with an update. It doesn't have to be, you know, really elaborate, but just so everyone knows exactly what's going on. But what I what I do is I send one email to my existing investors, but then I have a list of potential investors and I will also send it to them. Like sometimes I'll remove some, you know, sensitive information, but it just really really keeps them interested um, and I've also I've had a couple of investors that originally said no that then came back and said yes because I think from their perspective you know I can be really consistent the communications there and and they start to kind of form that trust because you know in the early days they don't they don't know you they don't know if you can actually execute so yeah they were three things that really worked for me that's really good to hear and I've I've heard a lot of founders talk about you know circulating investor updates emails as a way to build that relationship. Jody, what are some of the things that you look for when you're getting these update emails? Yeah, I think when we kind of quarrel, that this was like exactly one of the things I, I really love to get like as, a, as an investor, especially because we're series A, we're often tracking companies from very early stages um, for several years. And so getting those um, investor update emails is really important for us and really helpful. Um, so we can track the companies over time. I think um, a few different things we like to receive, again, de depends on the stage of the business, but I think sort of headline growth numbers, sort of revenue growth, any sort of key clients or customers you've won um, in that quarter um, that, that sort of impressed um, is, is impressive for you. Um, anything around sort of unit economics, um, if you're at that stage yet where you can track things like your CAC, um, you know, has it has it come down? Um, for example, your retention. Um, if again, if you have that data and it's you, um, you can share that with investors. So you know you've managed to renew X number of clients after a year. Um, other things we might look at is um, any key hires you've made from impressive companies that you've managed to attract. That's always really interesting for us. Um, I think those are sort of the, the headline things. Yeah, we would be interested to know. 
And what if you're at pre-revenue? What sort of things can you, and you haven't, and, and maybe they're not in your portfolio company yet. They're just trying to build that relationship with you. What sort of things are you looking to see? Yeah, I think at the pre-revenue stage, probably more things like pilots, um, you know, any stats you have from, from pilot programs, again, those sort of similar metrics around retention, engagement, um, you know, proof of ROI for a customer, um, perhaps you've done a pilot with the customer and now they've just signed a contract. So any sort of, I guess, metrics of, of showing that you're getting traction. Um, and even if you're pre-revenue, that traction might be, you know, they've they've extended for another few months, um, that that might be be something to share. And how frequently do you like to receive these update emails? As an, from an investor's perspective, because I know a lot of founders like to send monthly updates. Yeah, I think um, I think personally, especially again, depends on what stage you're at. I would say um, probably quarterly um, might might be better, um, just because you might have more interesting and, and and more to say that that it might be impactful, especially if you're you know slightly earlier stage. Quarterly might um, be more appropriate, and then as you're ramping up to to fundraise, maybe you change that to to, to monthly from from quarterly. That's that's really interesting to hear. I've been doing quarterly actually. Um, <laughs> um, the other thing is that in these update emails, like founders like to include an ask. So they like to ask the, these prospective investors or their existing investors for an ask. What sort of the thing do you think works best when founders are going through the ask? As in uh, things that are most likely to get a response from an investor? Yes, yes that's the better way of putting it. Um, that's a good question. Probably uh, things that investors are happy to share is sort of benchmarks or examples of, of what they're looking for as best in class. Um, they're happy to share that sort of, you know, for example, you know, what's a good tax payback uh, in, in this sector or that you've looked at within this industry um, or what's a good retention rate, those sorts of things. Investors are always happy to, to share that. Um, yeah, I think that's probably the main probably the main thing. Or I guess if they've got any feedback on specific metrics, um, you can always ask that. Like, do you think we're we're achieving this? Where do you think we need to get to to be interesting? Those sorts of um, sort of I guess specific questions, as specific as you can be, is is probably the best thing to do. And Laura, does that um, does that follow your experience as well? Yeah, totally. I mean, to be honest, when we've had an ask, it's normally to just our existing investors. Like at the moment, at the bottom of every email, it's like, you know, if you have any friends that want to co-invest alongside you, like, please introduce us. So it's just kind of a nod to that. Um, and then previously, I've also asked for, you know, like, has anyone got an introduction or a way into Wim Hof or whoever it is? And Lucy, do you frequently get these update emails from prospective founders as well? I mean, I'll be honest, I wish I got more investor updates from my current portfolio, to be honest with you. Um, quarterly is is what you would like. That's the dream. I'd say six monthly because, you know, that it's a founder. They've got three jobs already um, as a founder. So writing an investor update is obviously another job. But yes, I, I don't see enough investor updates. One thing that I would add is as um, I, I don't tend to get prospective investor update um, asks because I just direct them to Angel Academy. Um, however, if for my existing portfolio, if things aren't going great, don't hide it. Like one thing that is is really, you know, if you're going to suddenly get a cash call or if some things aren't going right and this hasn't been relayed to you at all as an investor, then you're basically you're much more likely to um, be able to help out and help out early if things aren't going quite as forecast um you know like the burn rate has changed the that your runway is is get looking shorter I think telling investors sooner rather than later is is only going to help because then quite often you know your investors we want to help we're invested it's in our interest that your company does well so we can often call on our network we can you know almost step in and you know offer advice offer connections so that would that would be another thing that i like to see is when things aren't going rosy don't pretend 
Okay, sounds like you're also speaking from experience as well. <laughs> <laughs> Not too much experience, but you know, <laughs> a little bit. And so at the early stage when you're deciding, you know, when is the right time to fundraise? Like, how do you know, Taryn, John, would you like to step in here? Well, for, for the most part, um, people have not made their company investor ready when I see them. So they're not prepared for doing what they need to do to be investable. And so that's where we end up spending a lot of time in our workshops around, you know, getting your financial discipline in order, getting your marketing in order, getting your customer discovery in order. Um, and so really getting clear on your strategic milestones that you're trying to accomplish. And then you have to decide as a, as a startup, if you're going to be a burner or an earner, um, are you going to grow, 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 and then at some large size be something that's very interesting? Um, and especially if you're using advertising as your revenue model, that's the path, right? Which is that you have special relationships with your funding, and therefore you can grow, grow, grow based on the idea and not based on the revenue. Or are you going to do it on the basis of revenue? From There's a guy here who, whose name Rob Wiltbank, who wrote a, uh, some studies of angel investing um, and showed that from an angel investor point of view, having a, an earner company that's managing its revenue and doing foundationally good business, they outperform as an investment compared to the billionaire um, kinds of hunting where you're hunting unicorns. So. I tend towards earner companies in my conversations with people. The fortunate thing is if you're in a down economy, that's exactly what you need, right? You need to control your expenses. You need to understand where you're at and, and have the financial discipline to have your customers pay you to do what you're doing. And then you take your outside money to transform your business to be more productive at the next level so that you get bigger as opposed to take the money to extend how long you can keep doing what you're already doing. And that, that distinction is really vital. And as our investors get more aware of what investing is about, they tend to want you to do things that change the productivity of, and valuation of the company rather than hire more people to do more of the same things that you're already doing at a lower productivity. Taryn, how about you? Well, actually, just to add some things that you have been talking previously. Uh, when we arrive, when the startups arrive to us as an early stage, they already have metrics. And what we do is like, I always compare, make the same comparisons like when an airplane is on the finger and it's going to take off. So that side, I'm not gonna get in any investment, but we are observing and we like to meet those startups before they arrive to the ask, asking to take off. And uh, once that they are starting to fly and they're still having the wheels on it is when we are going in. Then we get metrics, but from 10 Ks, it's a monthly uh, MRR metrics that we're looking at. And uh, the point is that we're looking for the business as, okay, which problems you're solving. Then we're looking at, okay, great. Uh, how are you gonna make your revenues? This pretty clearly. And then the third step where we take a small long time is the team. Actually for us is the 90% of the startups that they're failing in our portfolio is because of the team, not, not because of the business model. Because we have seen a lot of business model. We, we have almost 1,500 startups per year. Now I'm talking like a venture capital. We are, we are already investing in making a due diligence of 84 and we invest in four. So you need to have a lot of no's. Previously, you arrived to have an investor in it. That's my advice. Besides, it's very, um, I think you have to spend almost at least 40% of your time to search after investors. So that time is an opportunity because that you're not spending in your project. You cannot go and try to shoot to all the business and business angels or to all the VCs because you need to understand which is the stage maturity that you have right now. That's the first thing. And then to make a due diligence of the venture capital. 
not all of us we are agnostic not all of us we are some of them they are specific uh, funds for health or biotech and they're not investing in anything else so you should have to analyze see who are the other partner that you want to to get that meeting and start before you need the money six months before start to to, to go to all the um, events startup uh, events related you will meet their uh, business angel the business angel as 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 Lucy said previously, she wants you to grow. So she will put you in contact also with another investors, uh, bigger ones with series A, B, or C. And that's what all of us, we pretend when we're investing in you, that you grow and that is coming another bigger investor behind. So it's important to analyze and make a due diligence also from who are you going to go to talk to. That's my advice. Okay. And in terms of qualifying investors, um, Jody, you're a VC. What sort of things should a founder look for when they're qualifying who the right investor for them is? Yeah, I definitely agree with the the advice just been said around um, doing your research on on who to start and focus on in terms of your outreach. Um, because the, there are so many VCs, so many different investor groups, um, and it can be quite overwhelming and difficult to to manage. Um, so in terms of sort of whittling that down, um, I think first of all is is sort of check size and stage. Um, I think sector is super important. So um, like Taryn said, that there are lots of investors that will have specific focuses on on certain sectors. Um, so that's like the first way to whittle it down is just looking at, say, if you're in the health space, looking at specific health tech investors um, in your geography. Um, then, yeah, like I said, this the stage. So, um, you know, are they pre-seed, seed, series A, um, the, the check size they write um, is really important. Um, looking at example companies that they've backed, um, for example, going through their portfolio. Um, I think of other things you can do. Um, I think it's also worth um, speaking to, to, you know, in terms of diligencing funds as well, trying to speak to founders who they've recently invested in um, and asking them, um, you know, what was the due diligence process like is also can be quite helpful. Um, but yeah, I think, I think specifically those sorts of, you know, sector stage check size is sort of the, the, the first thing to do when you're, um, when you're first looking. Um, so the only other thing I would say is thinking about the type of investor in terms of are they, a, I think this has been mentioned already, but like a unicorn hunting venture capital fund. Um, so, you know, names like Boulderton, Index, um, you know, the really sort of tier one top venture funds that are looking for one company to return the whole fund um, versus investors who are more comfortable with a, you know, a, a you know, lower return, sort of a three to five X return. Um, that's also something worth thinking about in terms of the type of growth you're, you know, you, you, you are looking for and the type of exit you think you you can achieve. And Laura, I'd be interested to hear from you. What's been your experience as you're fundraising at the moment? What, how are you qualifying the right investor? So right now, most of them come through my network. Either they know someone that's already invested, but I will always do like similar to, to what everyone's just described. I will find out who else they've invested in and talk to them. And I did this once in the friends and family round because there was someone I was speaking to. And I, I can't remember how I even met him, but I didn't know him. And I spoke to another female founder and she said, run. <laughs> so that's like all I needed to know. So I just completely shut that conversation down. I'm so grateful that I actually did that, that, um, yeah, that check. So yeah, I would I would always do that, and also just never never be scared to say no to investor if they're not right. Like it's it's like dating, right? You'll you'll find out if you're both a fit for each other. And I think, you know, you often see it in startups, particularly in like the really early stages where someone offers their money and they just take it, and you don't think like, oh, you could have actually got that from someone else who would be more additive to the business. Um, and I think yeah, people sometimes will take too money just because it's there and it's on the table, and it's just it's not the right move. That's good to hear and good to know that, you know, leveraging your network and hearing anecdotal like um, advice from other founders is useful in the process as well. Um, Taryn, you, had, uh, you mentioned metrics earlier. I want to talk about that. What are the key metrics that founders need to obsess over as they're thinking about fundraising? 
Um, Lucy, I'd like to start with you if that's okay. Uh, I mean, it, again, it depends on the stage of the founder, the stage of the business that we're looking at. It depends on the sector that they're looking at. To be honest, obviously, yeah, metrics are super important when you're, you know, if you're a SaaS business, you're looking at the MR, MRR, if they have that, if they have a path to that, are they, how much have they got on the subscription or versus are they offering services to kind of bump their revenue at the beginning? So that's all something that we'll really, we'll look at at the angel stage. But I mean, people have mentioned the team and, and I think at the beginning of the journey, that really is such an important part of the business when we look before we look at the metrics, because if the team isn't right, then it doesn't really matter the metrics. Um, I obviously, when you've gone beyond pre-seed and you're more into where Jodie's looking at our company, then she will have metrics that are, you know, that, that they will definitely be looking at and they will, founders will need to have on board, you know, the, the cost of acquisition again depending on the sector but yeah the team the team is the team is really key I mean I'll just I'm looking from the angel stage there's something that we've sort of skirted around a bit before you when companies are looking for funding really make sure that you want to go down the funding route I think before anything if is getting external investors on board the right route for you because when you're on that train you then are on that train you're you're not it's not just your money and your you know your friends and family you've got investors that you've got to do updates for you know you're gonna then be raising again because they're gonna want you to be growing your business so I think before you even start this journey, really look at whether you want to fundraise and then do all of that pre-research. So you're going into your fundraising, having spent the time when you've not got a when you've got a sustainable burn that you can manage, then you can take that time out to do all of your preload your research, you know, find out what metrics people are going to look for, all of that. So I just think before we even get to this stage, it's good to take a step back and think, is that the path that you want to go down? And do you want to go to start that path now? And I guess there's a different outlook that angels and VCs take on an investment. Do you, would you agree with that, Lucy? Uh, well, yes, depending on the VC, I guess the Boldertons have definitely got a, um, a, a slightly different view. Angels were, I mean, one of the due diligence areas that we do look at that we do concentrate even in the earliest companies is their path to exit and their you know we look at the market size we look at how they the, the total addressable market size the you know the sound and how the percentage of that that they need to um find to generate the returns that can get as an exit but i think yeah in terms of how angels are looking at um, at exits and angels are it's a bit it is a different conversation okay and earlier john you mentioned that you're seeing that companies are not getting their companies ready to be investable and i want to talk about um data rooms and due diligence and in that same context um is there you know would you like to add any sort of information on what startups and founders can do to get their data rooms ready and be ready for dd well, let me let me take a step before that. Um, most people are not trying to sell me a business. They're trying to fund their project. And the funding of a project in the garage is not really exciting. It It's uh, an opportunity for me to be a philanthropist. And if I want to be a philanthropist, I will do it a different way. Um, so the switch, the mental switch from being a project oriented person to a business oriented person, where what I'm trying to sell to the investor is a piece of a business and the journey with that business is fundamental. And when you do that, then you stop telling me 80% about the details of the project and start telling me the 80% details about the market and the customer engagement and the content strategy and all of the other things. I, I still am continually surprised that people come into our program and they don't have Twitter addresses. Why is that surprising? That's surprising because early stage funders are inordinately active and very effective on Twitter. 
And so if you're trying to find early stage funders, you should be engaging with them, which means that you don't have a content strategy for selling your business because you're not interacting in the channel that your customers are at in the sense that you're trying to get the investors to invest in you. So I can find you a hundred people on Twitter that would write you a check if you were the right company, right? It's easy, it's there, it's active. So in that context, I've moved from being project oriented to being business oriented. I have now done my customer discovery. I'm very clear about my customer sub segments. I'm very clear about my early sub segment that will get me to cash flow positive fast. I'm focused on that business reality of having cash flow. And now I'm talking to an investor that says, You look very interesting to me. Let's find out more about you. So there's foundational questions, you know. How, how is your business structured? Who's in the business? Who owns what in the business? Just basic foundation things. But then we're going to want to know, you know, wh what's the experience and role of the team? And then how do I socially validate the team? What's the role of the market and what's going on in the market? And how is your marketing actually succeeding and working, right? And I should be able to find some digital footprint about your company and what you're doing in there somewhere. And then, you know, the fundamentals is your financial model. Underneath your financial model is hidden all of your assumptions about how the world is built. And what we're sure of is that your assumptions are wrong. We just don't know how wrong they are. And we want to sort of mush with them and try and get to some sense of about whether your assumptions about the world and our assumptions about the world align enough. And then when we find something that doesn't make sense to us, we want to understand how coachable you are in terms of addressing the question of that doesn't make sense to me. Our goal as investors is to understand where the edges of your risk are. And those should be evident in your data room. And then when we bring up a risk that you didn't put in your data room, we want to see you adapt and tell us how you're going to adjust to that risk. I would like to add something else uh, to wrap up a little bit of and add some value to all the other speakers. Uh, the funds, we are completely different. We have different strategies. We have different uh, portfolios and uh, we are, you should know as well, those startup, those funds that we are only investing in a portfolio of 25 startups, we do not have the same thing to do than the other ones that they are investing in 500 startups. They are completely looking to another, they are really good looking for metrics, those ones that they're investing in 500. They're not coming to support you as, as uh, Jody was saying before. And uh, it's not only a matter of smart money, uh, it's not a matter of money. It's also a matter of smart money to have uh, someone that is supporting you, that is coming at COVID, and they're looking with you your your burn rate and your runway for the next uh, month. And I think that metrics, uh, we are looking for sure the MLR, but we're also looking which is the range of... Um, of premium evaluation, your premium evaluation in the market, what will be for us is super important. If you are uh, having a MRR more bigger than a 200 case, we are not gonna invest. That's the chance for the Series A. We're gonna leave it over there. We also are investing uh, ticket size from half a million euros up to one million and a half, which doesn't mean that when we are making call outs to our LPs, we are asking. We are investing seventy percent of that amount of money, but the other thirty percent is we're just uh, waiting for the follow-ons in the next future. And uh, another advice in funds: we are investing the four years, the first four years. So if you're going to approach a fund, just ask them which is your vintage, because if we are, they are already done. They could be starting to uh, fundraise the second fund, the third fund but they're not investing really to startups by that time. 
So it's important for you. And as we talked previously, that you don't have to get engaged to the startup, uh, to the investor, because they're coming to bring, bring you money. You have to be always also in love. So you can also ask to the other investor, hey, which is your vintage? Maybe it's not the time for you, but in the next for the next round, they will be prepared. Or maybe when you're prepared to, to get funded is when they are already investing. And I don't know if someone wants to add anything else. Laura, I'd be interested to hear from you as you're going through this process at the moment. Is there anything you'd like to add? Um, I guess just a point on the, the data room. So this is the first time we've actually had one. And to be honest, I did not know what they actually were. <laughs> um, and I just spoke to one of my advisors who just put their data room together. He was going through a race himself. Um, and I've just got a really simple one. We host on Dropbox. We've got, you know, everything from our financial model, anything governance related, business related, just everything in there, really simple. Um, and it seems to be doing the, the job for now. I'm sure as we go on and we eventually raise our Series A, it'll be, you know, a lot more complex. But for now, it seems to, yeah, be giving everyone what they want. If you, if you do a search for um, due diligence checklist, you will get a really wide range of internet responses. And the further up you go in your stage, the more detailed and gnarly the questions get, right? And so what you need at pre-siege is very different than seed or series A, and it just gets worse and worse. The <laughs> thing that people usually do is that they start with the series A checklist, which then makes their head explode because they can't get the answers because it's not the appropriate checklist, right? So starting out with basics, right? Uh, the governance question, the financial models, your your progress with your um, market and how you're approaching your market. And, and that's probably enough at the early pre-seed. Um, but then the further you go, the more you move from faith capital to institutional capital, the more the numbers matter because the equations for the MBA equations start working. And Jody, is is there anything you, else you'd like to add on on this topic? Yeah, I'd say um, there's a, yeah, there's a few things that again I'm speaking from a Series A maybe seed and and some stages um, perspective, but something I feel like I don't see a lot of, and we end up asking for it, and it's quite a painful process for the founder to, to sort of do um, is a lot on the market and competition. Because I think a lot of the times, especially if you're speaking to a more generalist investor, or even if they do have sector expertise, you'll know far more about the market and competition than the investor will. But it's something that we we do care a lot about. So on the competition, I think the, the most common thing I just see in the deck is like that sort of typical matrix uh, and the company, your company is in the top, top right. Um, so I think sometimes we want to see a little bit more thoughts around, you know, maybe it's a table with all of your key sort of com competition and, and why you're different to them um, and really unpicking that rather than just on a surface level. And that doesn't have to sit in the pitch deck. It, it would probably sit in the data room. Um, and we want to really understand, um, you know, perhaps it can include quotes from customers on why they specifically chose you versus a competitor or, um, or, you know, what's been your win rate, um, you know, when you've approached customers, um, you know, what, what, how many times have you won versus the competitor in a, you know, competitive process, for example. So I think it's um, understanding a little bit more detail around what is your defensibility, what is your sort of moat, um, and why, why do you sort of beat the competition and, and in, for who and in what cases. Um, so I think unpacking competition um, for us is is really important, and often I don't I don't see enough um, insight into that that part of the uh, data room. Um, it, it, you're right in terms of that matrix. Uh, I think it's a very standard matrix that we see on a lot of pitch decks. Is there a pitch deck out there that's publicly available that's really good that you would say, okay, like that's like the gold standard? You'd like people to look at what they've done and it has is there anything you've come across no I, I don't think so I think I think the the key thing actually with with um pitch decks I find is a lot of it, it's, it's a horrible truth but I think a lot of VCs won't even open your pitch deck they'll or if they do they'll just look at the first flick through the first few slides um so I think often I always tell people um try and have some some sort of short overview or a one pager 
either do a one pager which you attach um which someone can just quickly look through and it just summarizes or do it in the body of the email and it summarizes um sort of the headline sort of things and what's exciting about your business um and and try and get to that that sort of call quite quickly um because yeah unfortunately a, a lot of investors don't don't will wait look through your entire pitch deck and if you do a pitch deck try and keep it to sort of 10 to 12 pages i would say so if if you have a pitch deck for pitching which is standing and talking that's not the same pitch deck that jody was just talking about 100%, which is the yeah. one that, that you put over the top of the transom and cold email into someone and in general a, a, a one pager will out, outperform the the pitch deck that you send in so totally agree we're going to move quickly into audience q a but lucy i just want to hear your take on pitch decks and due diligence and data rooms uh, yeah I, again the um, stage of the company data i mean data room we will look um we'll look at the team um, so we want all the contracts around your employment or anything. It's as a co-founder, any, you know, any contracts around that. Um, we will, yeah, financial model, your legal documents. If this, if you have raised before, we want to see your um, shareholder agreements, et cetera. If you haven't raised before, and this is the first time you'll be making them again, we want to hear how you're going to be going about doing that, um, any IP in tech. But I, I think... Um, Jody mentioned this as well. If the, and John, if there's something that isn't in the data room and we ask for it, it's how invest, it's how founders um, deal with that in a way, and how open they are to the tough questions that when things aren't in the data room or when we are not challenging but asking deeper questions on something, then an, um, an open and engaged founder is super important. Even if the answer at the time is, "I'm sorry, I don't know. I'm going to have to." delve a bit deeper into that myself you know don't um front something that you don't know open and honest is always the best <laughs> and also I would also say the best pitch deck in terms of your live pitching with the worst presentation you might as well have not had a deck so practice 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 <laughs> to yourself before you deliver your pitch because a really really great pitch deck is nothing without a great presentation that goes alongside it. Absolutely. And Laura, did you, how did you get help with your pitch deck? Was that something that you had your advisor Lee help you with, or did you get external consultants to help with the pitch deck? So the, the very first pitch deck I put together myself and Lee made me present it to him. And it was the most excruciating 10 minutes of my life. And if I now look back at that deck, it's just, it's awful. Um, but after that, I found, I think, you know, he had loads of um, previous pitch decks from various companies and I just had a, a huge folder of them. So I kind of looked through, figured out what seemed to work, you know, looked online and generally found like a rough structure. Um, but yeah, I think I, I think there's some sort of golden rule. It's like 10 pages, uh, no less than like type font size 20 or something. 10, 10 20, 30 rule. That's the one. <laughs> yeah, 10, 10 pages, tw uh, uh, 20 minute talk and 30 point font. There we go. Yeah. So to everyone's point, just keep it super kind of top line enough to get people interested. And I think particularly in the, you know, friends and family or seed raise, it's important to have that deck, but absolutely as well, we'll have the two pager. And I, I know if we're talking to institutions, then they're, they're not going to be looking like in depth through a deck. Um, but yeah, it has been, it has been super important so far. Thanks, Laura. I'm just going through the questions on the chat. John, by the way, thank you so much. You've been answering their questions as they've come. Does anyone have any question that hasn't been answered? Because it looks like John has been able to answer quite a lot of them on the chat group. Does anyone have any questions in the audience? Just put them in the chat or unmute yourself. Um, okay, I'll ask a question. Jody, um, when we spoke, there were quite a few challenges and pitfalls that you mentioned that founders typically make. Are there any that we haven't covered in this conversation that you'd like to address? Uh, that's a good question. Maybe not a, it's not necessarily a pitfall, but one thing I would say is really powerful and you can't do it for every single, every single time. Um, Cause I, I appreciate cold outreach is, is often going to be normal, but if you can get 
uh, a warm intro via some other party. I think as Laura mentioned, like the network part piece of this is so important. Um, I'm always gonna, which which is bad, but I'm always gonna spend a bit more time looking at a business that was introduced to me via another, you know, another founder, another venture fund, an advisor, some someone in my network. Um, so if you can, um, I always think it's interesting when, you know, I've looked at a business, I might pass on it. And the number of times a founder then won't follow up and say, you know, are there any other funds that you think could be relevant or interested in this business? Because, you know, maybe six, six times out of 10, I might, I might then pass that on and do a warm intro. Um, especially personally for me, if it's a female founder, I'm so much more likely to to refer you to, onto another investor. Um, so I think don't be afraid to ask for that referral to another investor because you never know um, if, if, you know, just because they, just because I said no to this business um, doesn't mean that I might, you know, I'm, I have a huge network of other VCs or angels that might be interested and might be a better fit. Um, so I, I'd say just don't get disheartened by uh, an investor saying no, always see it as an opportunity to get introduced to someone else that could be a better fit. Okay. And John, you had mentioned um, earlier that, you know, Twitter is a great platform to find and reach out to angels. What's a good way to get their attention on Twitter? Well, um, a lot of them are happy to respond when you just DM them directly and ask them a question about their post that they just made. So um, they're out on Twitter for a reason. They want to be found and have a conversation. So if you ask something useful, that's the number one thing. Um, in our ecosystem, we have a lot of um, public events. So we're running uh, 150 workshops a year. There's, there's no shortage of pathways to get warm introductions to the 64 entities that write pre-seed and seed checks in Seattle. So if you're coming in cold, it's because you're not doing your homework. Um, the, the access is available here. That I know is not true in other cities. Some cities don't, don't have a, a public engagement around startups in the same way. Um, and, but if you look at um, like Gust as a platform, you can get introductions through Gust. If you look through AngelList, you can get introductions that way. Um, if you uh, engage and just search for investors on LinkedIn who are members of angel groups that are listed in Gust, you can find people directly to have a conversation with um, where they're, uh, and again, I would I would pick the ones that are posting something and they probably said something about angel investing and then you ask them a question about what they just posted and then you ask them about the angel group that they're in and build a relationship rather than, hi, you want to get married? That's not usually a good first conversation. Okay. And, and Lucy, has that been your experience as well? Are you active on Twitter? Um, I have to admit, no, I'm not active on Twitter. Um, I all of my, all of my deal flow comes through Angel Academy. Um, they are fairly well known in well. There's a lot of um, there'll be well of the network people will know our name we try because a lot of male founders are more networked than female founders we do operate with just everybody fills in the same online form to apply to to get a pitching slot with angel academy that said a lot of people have been directed there or as a sort of intro but to enable people to who haven't got the network to have an equal footing, then everybody fills in the same form. It's all analyzed using the, you know, in the same way. Um, but yeah, I think just in terms of doing your network, doing your research for founding for when you are trying to fundraise, if you don't have any network or know anyone, just start asking people, anyone, you, yeah, exactly. It's doing your research. It's laying the groundwork for how you're going to access the funding. So you might not, you might come at it with no network, but I'm pretty sure that you can find somebody that can start you off on that network. Okay. So, so if you're if you're going to be a salesperson selling to your product and you're trying to find people, you might go to LinkedIn and start doing the work. Well, that same thing can happen 
I'm trying to sell a piece of my business and I'm going to do my work. And, uh, and then an angel says, I just invest in this company. I just had, uh, look, my portfolio company had an event. Let me retweet that or repost that on LinkedIn. So there's, there's digital footprints among the investors that you can find. And those are really useful. And Laura, when we spoke, you had some, in, you, you know, you had some crazy creative ways of getting the attention of some investors online. Can you share some stories? Yeah, sure. So one, I didn't actually mean to attract an investor this way, but I, I put up a photo of a load of business books that I really loved, you know, divided up by strategy, et cetera. And one of the ones I, I put up there was um, Business for Punks by James Watt, the founder of uh, BrewDog. And he saw the post and got in touch. And then we just ended up building a really good relationship and swapped like business tips for biohacking tips because that's you know my background. And then as soon as I told him about the idea for Monk, he was like, do you need money? And then you know he became my first investor and he's actually just followed on and, and joined our board. So yeah, post about people on Instagram. But I think I'm actually going to try and replicate that and start tagging some other authors that I really like and just see if we can get any more traction. But yeah, I think it things like that just often come from from really bizarre places amazing and before we wrap up um what i'd like to do is just go through the panel and maybe get your final final thoughts words of wisdom lucy could i start with you i think my word of wisdom would just be to be prepared so even before you start fundraising work out whether it's for you if you do feel like it's for you do your do lay the groundwork do your research and yeah come Come at it prepared. Prepare your pitch. Prepare your pitch. Just yeah. Jody, would you like to go next? Yeah, I think um one of my piece of advice is actually probably to speak to founders who are, you know, maybe, you know, say if you're you've got an idea, you're interested in pursuing it, maybe try and speak to a founder who's at sort of that series A stage in a similar space to you ask them about their journey, get their advice, get their experience, their pitfalls. Um, because yeah, obviously uh, as an investor, I only have one lens um, and I don't know how you know the exact entire whole ecosystem works. And I think just speaking to more founders and the space that you operate in before you dive in, um, similar to what Lucia said, is is probably really helpful. Um, and I'm sure they'll have, you know, amazing words of wisdom that will be super relevant for the sector and the business that that you operate in. Thank you. And Laura, would you like to go next? Sure. Um, I would say, remember that everything is an opportunity to sell. Like if you're emailing an investor, even if you're just answering a couple of questions, always add like a, you know, side note, did you see us in GQ magazine or just something that has like that bit of excitement or a value add to it? John? I think that... Uh... The great value of the Techstars Accelerators turns out to be the Techstars Founder Network. And they have a uh, annual Founders Summit where all of the CEOs of all the companies they've ever funded all get together. And the power and conversation in that room is just amazing. So if you can do anything to replicate the opportunity of finding a cohort of CEOs of startups that are about the same stage as you, who are active doing the kinds of things you wish you were doing, I you can't underestimate the value of that process. And then at, at the core, make sure this is about the business that you want to be involved in doing, because there are a lot of ways to construct a business that is not the business you want to be involved in anymore. And so um, make sure that you're building it so it's the right kind of business. And then take funding that supports that vision, not take arbitrary funding. Specifically, don't take money from people that give you things that will not give you other things besides money. If the only thing you're getting is money, that's the long investor. That's what a bank's for. And by other things, I guess you mean expertise? Expertise, introductions, uh, a shoulder to cry on, uh, a co-founder. Uh, there, are, there are dozens of things that angels can provide. Um, VCs provide them in a more institutional way, but they also provide introductions and certainly, you know, passing, getting you ready for the next round of funding above is, is also one of the things that they can do um, because they've seen it before. And so um, if you are not building a relationship with your early stage funders, you are missing an opportunity. Okay. 
Thank you. And Taryn, final words? Well, I will be quickly because they almost say everything about. Um, I will suggest you to, to, to search for a good mentor as well. Uh, they could provide you to avoid mistakes that it could take you a long time in order to detect them and put a solution in it. So being with another colleagues like uh, John mentioned it before, like another CEOs to see and to learn about their own experience and also someone that could uh, make you make easier and shorter your, um, your evolution. Thank you. Thank you.